Oh, what are we doing? Thank you. <laughs> it takes the whole village <laughs> just to take care of me. That's okay. We have one. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So, hmm. I heard someone say that they were a pastor. And they were saying that, um, he said, when you take up the offering, he said, you better take it up as though somebody's life depends on it because somebody's life is going to depend on it. And when he said that, I began to, to recall all the many times that giving unto God has saved me and has saved liberty, and has saved many of you. Because the offering is not just something that we do to um, keep the lights going. I mean, we're glad we have lights today, but that's not why we take up an offering. Could someone tell me why we take up an offering? Because we love God, and what does it do when you give to him? It brings the blessing down. When we are giving un, unto God on purpose, God's looking at our heart. When we give... Okay, so there's a difference between giving God a tip and offering to God sacrificially. Sometimes we just, you know, we say we're thankful to God for everything he does, but when... When we give to him, whether it be money, I mean, this happens to be money, but whether we give time, talent, energy, or finances, many times, as the people of God, we are giving him our leftovers. That's tipping God. It's like, thanks, here you go. I don't know if Jesus showed up today. <laughs> Yes. Um, if he was standing here instead of me, then you could see him. And he said, how valuable is what I've done for you already to you? How much would you give? Exactly. Whatever he asked, I'm not... Whatever he asks for, it's because he knows that you need the return on it. Whatever you give to him, he's only putting it in a heavenly account to multiply it for when you need it. The, the world says just the opposite. The world wants you to hold tight to everything you have. The world wants you to, to think that, uh, you know, we're only after your money in the church. Oh, my goodness. And... Um, and so it's been said so many times that people like consider it. And unfortunately, there has been manipulation in offerings. In case you've never sat under one, you'll know it when it happens. But instead of wanting to give to God, all of a sudden you feel compelled to give. But compelled out of manipulation, not out of a heart of love. And that's gross. And it's gross to God. And God is not, he's not happy about that. He's, he's like, they didn't get it. I mean, he's not going to kill the preacher because he did it wrong. But, but hopefully, he's going to change his heart to do it right. And he's not going to kill you for not giving. But he's hopefully going to change your heart to do it right. So when, when someone is, is saying this is an opportunity, to show an appreciation for what, who God is, what he's done, what he's doing, and what he'll continue to do for you, and that your harvest depends on your seed. They're talking kingdom words. These are biblical principles that he laid out for everyone to take advantage of, not to resent. 
when you present giving to the Lord, then, then you're missing out on your blessing even if you do give. Because if you're giving out of resentment, then just keep it in your pocket. Who cares? Because you're going to get nothing out of it. I'm not getting it for me. I'm getting it for you. So when I'm talking about giving unto the Lord, I am talking about giving unto the Lord with a whole heart abandonment to him. Like, what if he told you, what if he told you to give something big away? If you can't even give something little away, how will you give something big away? So if he told you to give a car, are you giving a car? If he told you to give a house, are you giving a house? If he told, I mean, I don't know how big we can get, however big your mind can go. If he told you to walk away from everything so that someone else could have it, how, how far are you going in your relationship with him? And so if we can't give him our tithes, then we certainly are not willing to give him more, even if he asks for it. And all that means is this, your return is stifled. What you're going to get back is just a small amount of what God really wanted for you. When, when he instituted seed time and harvest, it was a forever thing. Anybody seen a rainbow lately? So beautiful. Such a promise. And he wants us to get it inside of us so that we understand why we're giving, not just giving. I mean... It's good to give. You can't, you know, even the world knows it's good to give. But, but to give with purpose, to give with a grateful heart, it's a whole different animal. It's like now I'm tapping into what you said about enhancing the kingdom of God and I'm going to give you whatever you asked me for. So when we take the offering, don't just like... Take this for granted. Don't, don't not think about it. And also, don't not think about your return. It's okay to expect your harvest. But we're not giving just for the harvest. We're giving so that we have more than enough to help others. And so it's a bigger picture. God's picture is always a bigger picture. And so he wants you to give beyond, beyond what you think. Well, no, he, he doesn't. Sometimes, you know, Sometimes God just says, I, I just want you to give this much. Yeah. Whatever he tells you to give is okay with him. If you don't, he, he even trains you. If you don't have enough to give 10%, he'll go, okay, well, give this much, but your goal is to give 10% and beyond. And so there's no condemnation in Christ, but here's what it, there is, promises that are attached to your obedience. Well, that was good. I'm done. Okay. In Jesus' name, ushers wait on the people. Mm. Hallelujah. Make this declaration with me. I am giving this with purpose, with revelation, that whatever I give that you ask me for is out of obedience, and obedience is bringing the blessing. Beyond everything I could ever ask or think. So bring it on, Jesus. And whatever you ask of me, I will obey you in. Amen. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, so I am excited about this because um, the Lord has actually had this in me for weeks now, but We've been talking about restoring the tabernacle of David and that we live in Davy on purpose because God sat us here in this place for a purpose. And so um, how many of you know that or are aware or feel as though that right now there's a lot of darkness in the world? Do you feel that? Yeah. Okay, so now, listen, every time somebody says that, then they go, yeah, but there was darkness in the world, you know, when Hitler was around. Was that true? Yeah. There was darkness in the world when Jesus was alive and the Romans were persecuting everyone. Isn't that true? And so darkness is, darkness is just a part of what is happening on the earth. But I do believe that we have lived in this kind of 
pseudo bubble in America in that we don't understand how dark it really is because uh, I don't know anybody personally in America that got their heads chopped off or got, you know, sawn asunder. That means in half. Um, in America, I don't know of it. It could be possible, but I don't know. And so we're not so aware of it as other people in other countries that have seen these kind of things because to them, the darkness has overtaken. We think the darkness has overtaken because we're no longer as comfortable as we used to be. And so the, the Western church just doesn't have a great understanding how dark, dark is. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying you don't face challenges. I'm just saying there are some people that are facing more challenges than we are right now. Would you agree? Okay, but here is what the Bible tells us is really going on. And, and I don't think that... Okay, we look at darkness and we say, okay, darkness looks like this. And we have categories of what we think darkness looks like. And so we think if someone is really being tortured, that's darkness. If, if somebody's given their life, that's darkness. But, but we don't always look at the reality of what darkness is to us in this earth right now, in this place. So I'll tell you what darkness looks like so you can be aware of it. Darkness looks like deception. There is, whether anybody's aware of it or not, there's generations that Satan is trying to deceive. He's trying to deceive generation after generation. And if you, if you look at the um, definition of, oh, now I have to remember the name. What is it when you're selfish and altogether selfish? Narcissism. If you look at, the, at, at that and everything it means, entitlement is a word that everybody knows about. Selfishness is something that there's so much being unleashed on people that they're doing everything that is about them and nothing so much about God and what he has for their life. God is somewhere on the back burner. And so... The darkness in the United States is, is mostly distractions. It's mostly earthly gain. It's mostly about things that, that we don't see as darkness, and yet it's there. It's a cloud of deception that is starting to fall over people's minds and eyes so that they don't recognize that they're even being deceived. You know what the amazing thing about deception is? That the de person deceived doesn't know they're in deception. Because they can't see it. They're, they're clouded by what is going on in their life. They're clouded by other voices. They're clouded. And so this is what the Bible told us was going to happen. So Isaiah 60, verse 2, the first part of it says this, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and a thick darkness the peoples. If you've ever watched the news or heard about atrocities that have been done and said, how in the world can anyone ever do that? The statement itself tells you the answer. They're being overcome by the darkness of the world. You know, the, the person who, who shot the people in our local school said he heard voices. Well, I believe him. He heard voices, dark voices, and they're coming from the enemy. Satan is alive, and he's unleashing his terror, and he's doing it in different ways. But this is not about that, aren't you, Glenn? Say, move on, Pastor Don. I am. I have great news for the people of God. The next part of this verse is also true. Hallelujah. But the glory, the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Who's he talking to? If he's talking to you, raise your hand. Say, he's talking about me. Mm -hmm. Say, his glory is going to be seen upon me. Woo! Now look at somebody and say, upon you too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what is wonderful about this it's so wonderful. I mean, just to say those words are, they should get you excited. 
but what does it exactly mean and what are they talking about and and you know that's great there's darkness in the world but the lord's arising on me and his glory is going to be seen upon me but but how do i know that's happening And so it's in the time of worshiping him completely without anything blocking you that you receive from him. Now, okay, so Danielle was leading today and she is a worshiper. How many of you figured that out? Mm -hmm. Okay, but she's not a worshiper, just the church. Do you think? No. Okay, so if you go to her house, she has this big old piano sitting there. Yeah, she loves her piano. Because she'll just sit down at her piano anytime she feels like it, and she'll worship for hours. Am I right? And usually she has an audience of one, maybe two. (laughs) So she has an audience of God. Sometimes she has an audience of God and Farrell. (laughs) Oh, yes, don't forget the dog. (laughs) Nana. Oh, God, help me. And she loves it. That's why she's still alive, probably. (laughs) You're going to have a long life, that dog. And so, (laughs) but the point being this, is that if you're a worshiper, you don't just worship God at church. You just don't come in and hope that somebody's going to be anointed for whatever time frame that lasts, which we don't put time frames on worship. But, But if all you get is 20 minutes... For your week, you're going to leak. And at the end of the week, you're going to be weak. You know what I mean? So, so you have to keep that stirring in your heart where you are so enamored with the Lord. Like, he blows me away. He, if I think about him, if I read his word and it comes alive and, and the Holy Spirit does that, I'm, I'm like... How could anyone not worship you? I have to take praise breaks. Well, it's not really a break then, is it? It it becomes so necessary. Like you can't stop your mouth from forming words. You can't stop your hands from going up. Like I don't understand how people stand like this. I'm like, yes! (laughs) You're worthy. It's like just one more way to show him he's worthy. It's an act of surrender to him. And so... So all of those things happen because inside my heart, there's a, there's a revelation of him going on. That's When you worship him, you draw close to him. When he draws close to you, it's like heaven and earth are kissing. And all of a sudden, you get the revelation of how awesome he is. And then you're like, I want everyone to feel this way. And not only that, I want more. I'm not going to settle for what I've already experienced. I have to have more because there's always more of God for me to have. And I want it all. We, we can be selfish in that manner. I want all of God. I want revelation after revelation after revelation. So he makes you suddenly aware of the fact that you are made different. You, he's made you not to not only know him, but to be known of him. Think of how many people are in the earth right now? Didn't you say it the other day? 6.5 billion, at least. Okay. So God has the ability to be everywhere at all times. I know that ought to just bust your head open right there. And he hears each one of you individually and counts you amazing. Personal God. A personal Savior. A personal God. He he knows all about you and cares for you. When you cry, he's like, oh, there you are. When you cry out, he's answering you because he loves you, you. Not you because you belong to someone else, you because you belong to him. Amen? You know, your righteous relative is great if they pray for you, but your righteous relative is not what God is after. He's after you to be righteous as well. 
He wants you to know him and all of his glory, and your righteousness will be intact. Because when you're close to him, you don't want any nonsense in between you and him. It's like, no barriers. Get that out of my life. Get that out of my life. I'm not going to believe that lie anymore. All of a sudden, you know the lies. You know what Satan's been doing, and you, you can't stand it anymore. You want freedom. You want to think like God thinks because it's available. Do you know you can have the mind of Christ? Well, that's what it says. You know, here's an amazing thing. The glory is going to be seen on you, and that is something that Satan can never give to anyone. Okay. Satan has the ability, as a God of this world, to offer temporary fame. Some people have sold out to that, you know. He can, he can give people temporary fortune. He can give them experiences. He can give them experiences of the soul. He can give them experiences we don't even want to know about. You know what I'm saying? He can give them some of that, but he can never offer what every person really needs. He never can because he doesn't have it anymore. Every person, every single person wants to know what their purpose is. That's what everybody is looking for. And every person has a desire to know that they can go into a situation and no matter what it is, they're still loved. This is driving me crazy. Okay. Because without that knowledge, you'll never be complete. You're never going to be complete. So Romans says it perfectly. I'm not making this stuff up. Romans 8.21 from the Passion Translation. It says, All creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. Now, you have to understand that sin is what separates you from the Father. That's why Jesus came. So, but God sent Jesus to restore our relationship with love. He came so that we could be restored in not only loving someone, but receiving his love so we can love properly. Amen? Okay, so... When we know that we are loved, when we really have an experience, I can tell you that all day long, but until you experience his love overtaking you, you'll never understand it the way you should. When you're sitting at his feet and you've blocked out everything except for him, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit can come and become that agent that reveals who he is and how he loves you. And in that time of love, you are transformed in a way that causes you to love him back, which causes you to be able to love other people properly. So it's a transformation process. But he wants you to be complete in him. And guess what? When you start doing that, Satan, it drives Satan crazy. And if for no other reason, you should do it for that reason. Because Satan is going crazy because he sees lovers of God. And he can never op offer anyone the opportunity of a satisfying life. It'll, he'll, just, he'll just use you like a ping pong ball. He'll just like have you battering around all over and, and finding not anything that truly satisfies. Because the only thing that truly satisfies is the essence of God. The very essence of God. Amen? The, he can't give you the ability to be with God because he's been blocked out. Satan was thrown out of heaven. He will never be able to come near the Lord. He will never be able to go to heaven again. He will never experience love again. He is altogether hatred. So if you think he's not out to kill, steal, and destroy you, his character is exactly that. Hey, yes, okay. But the good news is when you choose him and you worship him, you destroy darkness. Okay, even darkness that may still have a hold on you. So if you've ever experienced that, God's looking at your heart, and when you see somebody that is hungry for him, he opens up his heart, 
and throws it into your heart, and all of a sudden you have a glorious awakening to what he's really like. Amen? Okay. The reality of the scripture is going to happen when you're sitting with him. He will arise, and his glory will be so deep in us, it'll be able to see on God's people. Okay, so you know we've been talking about what words mean, and so... His glory will be seen upon you. Glory here is from the word kabod. You probably heard me say this before. Kabod is the weightiness. And as we learned, that's the, that is the kabod of God, the weightiness of God that came when they dedicated Solomon's temple and it caused the people to fall on the ground. It is what we call being slain in the spirit. Some people come into this church and they see somebody fall over and they're like, are they dead? What's going on? This is weird. We don't understand. And how would you understand? How, how would you understand that? But the word shows us what that is really like. And the kabod of God is the weightiness of God that comes upon your body when his glory is so uh, present and had the weightiness of who he is, your natural body cannot stand up under it. And so it just relaxes and lets the spirit take over because the only way you can handle what is going on is spirit to spirit. And so when someone is slain in the spirit, that's exactly what they are. In the spirit, God has taken them out of being able to operate in their natural. Because you know, if we can, and I've heard so many people say, I'm, I was standing in that line and I'm not going down. Because that's weird. I'm not going down. Until God shows up and whacks them right out of what they think is sensible... And all of a sudden, they are one-on-one -on -one with God experiencing his glory. And then you can never take that experience away from them. It is the most valuable times in his presence. It can happen at home when you're alone. I mean, don't stand up. <laughs> of the spirit just sit down on purpose and let his spirit take over i mean could you imagine that would be kind of funny to watch though it's about hunger it's about interaction with him it's about him manifesting his glory to you in such a way that his glory is more you're more aware of him more aware of his presence more aware of what's you don't even know what's going on with your body when, when the soldiers went into the garden to try to take Jesus away, I mean, Jesus could have spoke to them and they could have all been blown away. But when he said, uh, when they said, where's Jesus? He said, I am he. They all fell out in the spirit. And then they had to get back up and take him. How stupid are they? They get back up and continue their dirty deed, you know? You know, so I'd be like, send the next troops in, you know, because it had to happen, but. You, you get an experience with God, you wouldn't be one of those people that want to continue this. So, he needs everyone's hearts, the body of Christ's hearts need to be adjusted. That it's not about, it's not about natural feelings anymore. He wants us to come to a place where we're so excited about him and who he is and what he does, that we filter through whatever stuff is in our way. I don't care if it's circumstances. I don't care if it's bad news. I don't care if somebody just did you wrong song. I, I don't, whatever it is, we need to throw away the debris and get into his presence where his presence fills us up to overflowing and we are so enthralled with him, there is a dynamic that begins to happen and his glory actually becomes a part of you. So when we understand what the glory is like, the word kabod tells us different explanations of what that means. One of them is that we will have God sense. For goodness sake, have some God sense. Right? 
And so God senses a revival. I mean, that, that means that we will be able to handle whatever situation we're facing with the mind of God, with the understanding of what he has. And through whatever we're going through, we can still operate in the glory to give back to him. That is amazing. There's also, it also means splendor. It means a great brightness, a beam of light here and there and everywhere. So we're supposed to be the light in the darkness. When my dad got saved... He didn't know anything about anything. He just, he actually went to service a little drunk. Yeah. Because he spilled stuff all over my grandma's Thanksgiving tablecloth. The, the red juice. And, um, and so he said, oh, mom, what can I do to make up for it? And she said, go to church with me tonight. Now he's nailed. What are you going to do? Tell your mother no. And so he went to church that night. And when he got there, it was Reverend Angelie's church, uh, that was kind of funny. <laughs> and so at the end of the service, when they gave the altar call, they don't even remember. They couldn't remember if mom went down first or dad went down first. But whichever one went down first, the other one said, if they're doing it, I'm doing it, because we're not going to be opposed in this life. We, we got to get together on this. And so they both went down to the altar. When my dad went down, and he said that he, he gave his heart literally to God. He didn't just say a sinner's prayer, and it didn't mean anything to him. He literally was repenting because he knew what a dirty dog he was. You know, he knew what a dirty dog he was. That's what I'm going to say. And so he had a revelation of who he wasn't yet. And God gave him an opportunity to be what he planned for him to be. And when he said yes to that, his experience was that he went on the floor. And as the kabod of God came on him, he had this experience. He had the light of God beat on him. And he actually thought that he was such a bad sinner. <laughs> that they were holding a light over his head on the floor. And that he was, and he couldn't move. And he's like, I can't even get up from this. This is kind of embarrassing. I don't know what's happening. But at the same time, there was something being instilled inside of him that was changing his life forever. That from that day forward, he would serve the Lord. Amen. And so he came up from that place a different man than he went down. It took away from the natural, but it certainly infused the spirit inside of him, and he was changed. And that is everybody's experience when you come to know the Lord. Whether you're standing up or standing down, it's okay. It's the weightiness of God that actually changes you, not a prayer that you pray. It's a revelation that you get because his presence is so real to you. You're aware of who you're not, but you're also aware of who he who says you can be. Amen? And so it also means, um, kabod means yielding to something abundantly. It means that you have expression and style to your, to your awareness of it. It means that when God is, is here because we're praising him, it means that he gives you more than the normal to express your love for him. You are passionate and you are doing something to express your love, whatever it is. If you're not at least jumping up and down on the inside of you, you need to wake up your spirit. Amen. And so... David was our good example of giving everything to God when he was dancing before him with all of his might. People didn't understand that. But it didn't stop David because people didn't understand it. God understood it. I mean, he's, he's looking at the glory of God going, Whoo! <laughs> like, I cannot contain what I am looking at. I cannot contain my love for him. I cannot uh, contain the excitement of what God is about ready to do and what he's doing to me right now. And so he just let everything fly. Amen. And God showed up. But kabod also means this, possessing glory. Possessing glory. So we don't get to just visit the glory of God coming. We visit sometimes 
But what we don't have knowledge of is that he didn't come to visit us. He came to possess us. And the glory of the God is living inside of you. Once you know him, then you have to recognize that the glory is inside of you. That's when nothing else matters to you except for getting closer and closer and closer to him. When you're fully aware how wonderful and delightful serving him is, when you know that you can be saturated by him, when all of a sudden you can't think of anything else except for what he's doing and what he's saying and the things he speaks to you are words of life. They take away death. They take away what Satan is trying to do to you. And so... God's looking for the restoration of the temple. Like we've been talking about the restoration of David's temple. But the restoration of David's temple was just a place where David had a revelation that people needed to come in and experience God. That's great. But God isn't looking for us to just acknowledge that. I mean, good for David. He brought the New Testament into the old. But but what about us? We are the temple. God is now looking for a restoration of his temple in us, the church. He's looking to bring a restoration of revival for us. He's looking for us to be so enamored with him that we cannot be silent. He's looking for a people that are dissatisfied. And by that, I mean not dissatisfied with God. Hmm. Some people get dissatisfied with God when God doesn't do what they thought he should do at the time they thought he should do it. And you become dissatisfied with God. And if you say that never happened to you, you're probably lying. Okay. But God is looking for a restoration for his people, the church, that are dissatisfied with the world. He's looking for people who are dissatisfied with anything that the world has to offer because it's all substitutes. It's not even anything of substance. There's, it just falls through your fingers. At the end, it's just nothingness. Okay, so dissatisfied with making choices that cause you harm. He's looking for people who are dissatisfied with choices that are stupid. (laughs) You know, I mean, how many of you have a list of things you ever did that was stupid that you wish you could go back and redo, right? Okay, all right. So, but you don't have to keep doing the same thing over and over again. You know, you can change. You can change and you can have, you can be dissatisfied with those choices and ask God for better choices, amen? Amen. He wants you to be dissatisfied with worldly pleasures. Uh, This is a hard one. Because, I mean, the Bible tells us that sin is fun for a season. So, I mean, you experience something new in the world and it, it makes you excited. I mean, I don't, listen, I don't know what your sin is that makes you excited. So I'm not even going to try to address that. I'm just saying, he always dangles something that is a worldly pleasure that will take you away from the pleasure of being with him. All right, well, I will knock on this for a minute. How much media stuff, what, what if you never did Facebook or Instagram again or whatever that new stuff is that I'm all too old to know about? There's like lists of stuff. I don't know. Okay, and I don't care, okay? Um, so if you took the time that you spent on that or games or what, video, I don't know, all that stuff where you kill everybody every minute, that stuff. If you took that away from your life and you locked yourself away from God, which one do you think is going to be more productive for your future? I don't care how many people you killed today on whatever game that was. All that is is a distraction to your spirit. All it is is eating away at you. I don't care 
how much time, okay, so I'm, I'm going to get away from, you know, people are like, okay, you're, you're jumping on my toes. Okay, so let's go to this one. <laughs> what about this? How much thought do you give to what the enemy is doing in your life instead of what God is doing in your life? Like, where's the scale? Like, where are you tipping the scale? Satan will make sure. If you're going to give him all your attention for things going wrong, he'll just keep making things go wrong because he's going to keep your attention because the thing he doesn't want you to have your attention on is that. He, he is so afraid that the people of God are going to rise up and keep their eyes fixed on the Lord and have experiences with him that are changing them that he keeps giving you distractions. And as long as you fall for it, he'll keep giving you distractions. So we have to be aware of what he is doing and get a spirit revelation of who we are. Your identity is not your circumstances. Write it down. Stick it everywhere. You may be going through something, but if you're with Christ, you're going through it. I'm not trying to minimize whatever you're facing. I'm just saying if you're facing it with him, you win. You may have to do something, but you're going to do it with victory on the other side. And so your identity is not being a beggar. You know, can you imagine how God feels when people go to him and say, Lord, would you please, would you please pay my bill? Would, I, I can't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Would you please pay my bill? Would you please pay my bill? Would you, ple would you please pay my bill? And then the next day, it's like, would you please pay my bill? Would you please pay my bill? Would you please pay my bill? And then the next day, it's please pay my bill. Please, would you pay that bill? God, who's going to pay that bill? I don't, I don't see anything happening. Would you pay that bill? And God's like, I gave you the ability to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Let your soul be with me. I'll take care of you. I never, I never forgot my promises concerning you. I have a cattle on a thousand hill, not because I need it, because you need it. I'll just throw a cow down for you. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whatever it takes. Okay. So, you know, poor God. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he's not poor, but poor God that he has to listen to all of us being poor with our poor thinking. He's like, man, you don't, you don't get it. You don't get me. You don't know me. You don't know my character. You don't know what I've provided. Just come. Come and I'm going to give you a new revelation of me. And in that revelation, you're not going to worry about money anymore. In that revelation, you're going to understand that things line up with the kingdom. And when they line up with the kingdom, you can't keep the blessing from coming. You just have to get yourself aligned with him, and in your alignment, woo, it flows. Yeah. I've never seen the righteous begging bread or forsaken. Amen? So your identity is not a beggar. Quit begging. Quit begging for things that have already been provided. Start declaring what he said, and if you need to adjust something in your life, adjust it. What's the big deal? Your identity is not, I wonder who I am. Your identity is not that. It's not like, I wonder who I am. They know who they are, but you don't know who I am. You call me pastor because that's the title he gave me. You call me prophet because that's the title he gave me that, to operate through. But the person that I am can only be found in Christ. Your identity is found when you are secured in him. My identity is child of the most high God. That's who I am. My, my identity is lover of God and won't quit. That's who I am. Not lover of God who never has to face anything. Lover of God that won't stop. Lover of God that still loves, no matter what. Lover of God that stays pliable in case God needs to 
you know, tell me, you got to get rid of this. And I get rid of it. Because he's worth it all. Okay. So, your identity is this. You ready to know what it is? You are accepted in the beloved. That is it. That's your whole identity. If you can find out and really believe and experience his acceptance, wow. People are always trying to be accepted. They want other people to accept them in school. They want their bosses to accept them. They want their coworkers to accept them. They want lovers to accept them. They want whatever. They're always looking for acceptance, okay? But even none of those things will matter you have to be, know that your identity is that you're accepted in him. There is, God is a God that loves eternally. And so I want you to really think about this. God chose you. God chose you. I'm going to let that sink in. God chose you. God chose us. But beyond choosing you, it's kind of like, you know when your parents told you that they loved you unconditionally and you go, you have to, I'm yours. Like, you had me, now you have to put up with me for the rest of your life. (laughs) No. No, God wants you. He's always wanted you. He still wants you. He chose you, he wants you, and he invited you, and his invitation is this. Be a part of my family. And when you say yes to that by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you stand in front of him, and you're talking to him, and you're asking him questions, he can't tell if it's you or Jesus. I know that's hard for our minds to all take in, but Jesus grafted us in as sons and daughters of God, and he doesn't look at us through cross eyes. He's not like, you don't look much like Jesus. He's like, oh, yeah, that blood that saved the firstborn in Egypt, that's on all over you. Like, that blood is your identity. You're hidden because of what price Christ paid for you, and now when you stand before him, he sees you as his family. He sees you as daughter. He sees you as son. And not only does he see you that way, he is so absolutely equipped with everything that you need that when you say, Daddy, he says, what do you want, cutie? What is it that you have need of? Okay, well, if you've ever had a grandchild or even a baby, and the moment you hold whichever, you're like, I would die for you. That's what, that's what God said. He made you in his image and likeness, and then he goes, I would die for you. Oh, actually, I will. I have to die for you. When you sin, I will. And you're worth it. And you're worth it. So he said for every single person on the entire planet, that price is enough. Now, identify with me as a child, as I'm your dad, as I have everything you need. I mean, you know, there was only so much stuff my parents could provide for me. They could only provide whatever they had to provide with. But Jesus, the Father, The Holy Spirit, they have no limits. They have everything you have need of. And so he made you accepted in the beloved. He brought us and caught us out of that web of darkness, and he brought us back to life by the Spirit of God. Is anybody with me today? Okay. Then you want to be dancing before him with all of your might because you understand that you're accepted to the Father just as much as Jesus is. Uh, 
I know he loves Jesus. Do you know he loves Jesus? But do you know he loves you the same way? The same filter sees you without anything wrong. He thinks you're just so wonderful and cute and glorious and he'll give you he'll give you whatever you ask when you come in the name of Jesus. He will give you what you have need of. So mind ascension cannot do that for you. The enemy can never offer that to you. He can only give you substitutes. Okay, Romans 8:16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. See, we can't even understand that. I'm saying it to you, and I know we can't understand it. Because if we're the children of God and we look and act to him like Jesus, that blows my mind because I know I'm imperfect. Are you guys perfect yet? Well, so... <laughs> There are some people looking at me as though you know I am, you know. Okay, we won't say names. <laughs> but it is by a revelation of the Spirit of God that we know how we look to him as his children. It's by a revelation of the Spirit. And so it bears witness with us. It means to testify jointly. It means to support with authority. And so the Holy Spirit comes into our life and he goes, you really are like Jesus. Let me show you what that looks like. Let me show you what that feels like. Let me show you that when you're standing before God, this is really who he's seeing. You the same as Jesus. So it says in, in verse, the next verse, and if children, hello, get ready for good news, then heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now, when he said, people go, oh, no, I don't want to suffer with him. <laughs> okay. Listen, I don't know how, he, how you're going to suffer with him. I, don't, I can't tell you you're going to have a glorious life and that someday you may not be required to give your life for the Lord. I mean, some people here want to be martyrs. Uh, I, I don't really care. I used to care. I don't care anymore. Uh, try to get somebody to get me to say that I don't love Jesus. You want, who cares what they do? You, I will never come off of that post. I love Jesus, and that's the way I'm going to the grave, loving Jesus. They cannot take that away. And they shouldn't be able to take that away from you either. But it says to become acquainted with his sufferings. This is the thing that, that happens when you are after God's heart. You become acquainted with the reality of the price that Jesus paid for you. He suffered for you. He took all of the pain on his back. He took the pain of shame. He was, he was naked, hanging on a cross for sins he never did. False accusations took him to the cross. Sin took him to the cross. And he had to watch all of his disciples abandon him one by one. John showed up. He said, oh, you get my mom. You're the only one there. You get my mom because you actually came to the foot of the cross. If we can suffer with him, that means this. We become so aware of what he did for us that we can never forget it. If you ever watch the passion of the Christ, it'll help you. It'll horrify you but it will help you because it makes you more aware of the price that he paid. But there are times when, when I'm in prayer that I get a revelation of what he's done. So recently, again, he said, I am horrified by the news. I try not to watch it, but I do every once in a while get a glimpse of what is going on. And whenever there is atrocities against children, I almost can't stand it. It is just horrifying to me in every way. And so, you know, there was, there's perpetrators of children. And there's, there's people who are in human trafficking. And I, blah. 
And so just the mere thought of taking away your dignity, that just takes away all your dignity. And so, you know, I'm praying and I'm, I'm just repenting in the gap. And, and I'm just like going, please protect the children and stop this horror from happening. And, and he said, well, will you pray for the perpetrator? I go, no. I'm not paying for no perpetrator. I mean, like, if I was God, they'd already be grease spots. <laughs> You know, geez, you know. And so <laughs> that's just being honest, okay. And he said, but you know I love them. I'm like, no, you don't. You can't. They're creepier than any creep. And he's like, no, I love them. He goes, they're still, they're still my, made to be my son and daughter. They're not acting like sons and daughters. But they're made to be my son and daughter. Somebody has to pray for them. I'm like, okay, I can't. I, I mean, I love you, but I can't. I can't. They creep me out. Like, this is the most horrifying thing. I, I can't do it. And he goes, I, but you have to. And I said, okay, then if I have to, then you're going to have to help me because there's nothing inside of me that wants to pray for these people. I just want them all to die. Well, I did. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So shocking, I know. <laughs> I'm like, just rid the earth of them. They're vermin, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> not that I ever had those thoughts or anything like that, right? And so I said, okay, Lord, all right, I'm going to set aside my own feelings, but here's that you're going to have to show me how you feel about them so that I can get in touch with your suffering for them. Can you imagine how God feels seeing someone created in his image and his likeness doing that when he paid the price to set them free? And all of a sudden, I had compassion, and I could pray for them, and I could say, okay, God, then I, I am going, I don't know what happened in their life. You know, hurting people hurt people, and it just starts the ball rolling, and it just keeps getting worse and getting worse and getting worse. We don't know what people have been through. We don't know what somebody did to them before they did something to somebody else. All we see is the current situation. But God looks at the whole picture, and he knows exactly what every child of his has been through and he loves them enough to set them free but he'll never set them free without an intercessor so we if we suffer with him and if we get our own emotions into alignment with his heart then we become heirs with him it uh, it's like it's the door that opens up to our inheritance when we're willing to do the unthinkable. To me, the unthinkable was that. Pray for somebody who I think doesn't deserve it. That was unthinkable to me, but it wasn't unthinkable to God because he loves them. And so we come into the possession of the rights that we have divinely. So I looked up inheritors. Okay, inheritance. And I swear to you, this is Merriam-Webster's dictionary under inherit. It says this. To come into possession of or receive, especially as a right or a divine portion. And then it says, Matthew 19, 29. In the dictionary. For real. I love Merriam-Webster. And everyone that has left houses or brothers or sisters for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. It's in the dictionary. If you didn't believe the word of God, they put it in the dictionary for you under inheritance. <laughs> so define the real meaning of the word of God in the dictionary. Hallelujah. Okay, so I'm going to read these to you in the Passion, these verses in the Passion Translation. Okay, so Father God, right now, Lord, I thank you that right now you are making this real to every person. Lord, I, I am asking for what I have asked you for. Holy Spirit, your presence making this come alive to them, that these are not words written on a page. 
but that this becomes reality to them spirit to spirit. Lord, I thank you that you wrote these words so that we could become one with you and understand who you really are on the inside of us and what we're capable of. So Holy Spirit, I'm counting on you right now. And you said I could. And you said you'd come. Romans 8, 16. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all of his treasures, for indeed we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him, providing that we accept his sufferings as our own. And I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than anything compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. What if we're praying for revival and revival comes just because men and women and children of God begin to recognize that it's just a revelation of joining the glory he's deposited inside of them with the glory of God. The next verse says, the entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. The world is waiting for something different to happen. The world is waiting for us to be changed into his glory. I don't believe that God wastes his words. If he said that was possible, then that is possible. I don't see a whole lot of, I see some. I think God's changing us. I think his glory is in the house of liberty. I think it's in a lot of places where God is transforming people but nothing to the degree and the magnitude that it should be, that it can be. But that's who God is looking for. Someone who has identified with him to the point that they know they're being changed from glory to glory. That means the glory that is in you with the glory that he carries to you. When that happens, we turn into the lights that we're supposed to be. And when we are those people, then revival will automatically occur. It won't be something we have to muster up. If you understand what he said to you, that he whispers into your innermost being that you are God's beloved child, that alone should get you excited and glowing for him. You should be telling people about the way that they're living is so far beneath what they can be because they have the ability to be co-glorified with Christ. We... We think it's great if his name is glorified. We think it's great that he did what he did for us, but we don't even identify with the fact that he made us like him and made us one with that glory. At the end of the age, at the end of the age, when everything is said and done, 
when the rapture takes place, and someday I'll have to teach you about all of this, when there is a catching away of God's people, there will be a rapture that takes us to be in his presence. But then there will be a millennial reign, 1,000 years, where he will return and he will set up his kingdom. And there will be those of us that will rule and reign with him. And that is before he throws the devil into everlasting hell. And unfortunately, whoever doesn't accept Christ will go with him. But when all is said and done, and we are one with him in the heavens that he creates and the earth that he creates for everlasting, then here's what he says about that. If, Revelations 21, 24, I almost passed out when I realized this one. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Do you know you're a king? He's fashioned you to be just like his son. His son is a king. When everything is said and done, and we are going to live eternally, the glory that he has deposited on the inside of us will join the glory of God himself and we will bring it into heaven with us. We bring it with us. God's deposit goes with us. And you think you're not important? You think you don't have value? You don't understand what, how could God allow this to happen? He gave you opportunity to have his glory living on the inside of you. You're going to take that glory somewhere. This is what it will look like. The gates will not be shut at all by day, and there will be no night there and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. The glory and honor of the nations, the, one, the ones who acknowledged him, who received him, who walked with him, who carried with him the glory that was necessary to bring change on the earth. And so it all happens when we're all in. When we... When we draw near to him without any agenda except for him, when his people come to him not with their prayer needs, but they come to him just saying, I need to know more about you. I want to know your heart. I want to know what you're thinking about. How can I pray today in accordance with you? What is on Jesus' heart? How can I join you in this? How can I change? I have have this person on my heart. You must have put that person in my heart. How can I pray this through for them? Help me. Help me to have a revelation of your love. So years ago, I went into a vision, and I heard voices from every nation, and I knew that they were were all saying this. They were all saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. At the time that I had the vision, I was, we were on 441. I heard trumpets sounding at the same time. Jane was there, so I said, Jane, you got to write this down. So she was in the office typing as I had the vision. And as I had the vision, I didn't understand the complete picture of the vision. I just was having the vision. That's all that was happening. It, well, the Spirit of God was there, but I didn't understand it all. So, you know, we, we have these experiences with God, and then we try to put them in some kind of box that we can understand. And so, a lot of times, we take away the magnitude of it. And so, when, when I was saying, come Lord Jesus, come, I thought people were crying out for the rapture to take place. I'm like, yeah, no kidding, come. But, but it wasn't that, okay? And so I saw this grid coming down from heaven, and it looked like the grid of the city of Jerusalem. 
and the city of David was coming from heaven to earth, and then, then another one came, and it went into the, the first one, and it fit perfectly, and then I saw the third one, and it fit inside the second, but when, when the third one fit inside, it was like fluid, like you couldn't tell that there were three grids, there was just, it was all one, and so then when I was, when I was starting to teach all this and get a revelation about this, the Lord brought me back to that vision. And he said, the first grid is the glory that God released from the heavenly Jerusalem that was in his heart when Jesus came. He released Jerusalem, his body, into the earth. Jerusalem, Zion, same inner face. Okay. The second grid is that what would happen from heaven when it would join with the glory of those that are one with him and that had revelation of the glory of him that changed them so much that they could release the glory to someone else. That's the second grid, and I believe that's where we're living right now. We're living where we're becoming aware of his glory to the point that we will actually release his glory and it has the ability to change lives. And the third grid is their final return of the great king, where, of course, there'll be total fluidity, where we'll be one with him forever as his kingdom comes to total restoration and he will reign forever and ever with us. So all of that is reality to me because I was with him and because he wants you to know or he wouldn't share it with me. And so, when the atmosphere is full of the knowledge of that, if you just get your head out of the natural and into eternal things, everything shifts. We're trying to fit God into our life, and God is trying to fit his life into us. And so, we're called to listen to the Spirit and base our beliefs on the Word. And so... I believe with all of my being that he is stirring hearts in people to seek him and know him and carry him to others. So all in is not a catchphrase. It's not something I just made up. It's a prophetic declaration calling to all of us to respond to him and to hear him and to become like him. And so, in surrender to him, we find out who we really are, what we're capable of, but we also find out something more glorious. Um, what he's capable of. In my lifetime... Just in my lifetime, I have seen, oh, I've seen many things. I've, I've experienced many revivals. I've seen a lot of healings. I've seen a lot of miracles. I've had miracles. I've experienced in myself. I've prayed for people, and they've gotten healed and had miracles, not just healing. I've seen people's lives totally transformed from darkness to light. I mean... There's nothing better than salvation. I mean, all the other stuff is just icing. But I am still hungry. I'm still desperate. I'm still crying out. I still know that there's more of him available, not only to me, but other people. And... It's talk about being identified with the sufferings of Christ. I identify with how he feels with people not responding to him. When you see people choosing other things besides Jesus, that's suffering. When you see people who would prefer darkness over light, oh my God. 
eternity is real. And someday people are going somewhere. And that makes me suffer. And I become identified with the necessity of not only saying these things, but living them in such a way that other people can experience him. And then you recognize your frailties. And you realize that no matter how good you are, even if you think you have never sinned, you have. No matter how much you think you've transformed, and hopefully we have, you're never done. There's always another place inside of us that needs to conform to the image of him. But as we do, and as we seek him first, really first, not as an afterthought, not somewhere on the rung, not... Then he'll have a transformed people who are desperate to share how wonderful he is with someone else. I don't mean necessarily running in to and fro and handing out tracks, although tracks got a lot of people saved. So I'm not against them either. The other day we were out somewhere and somebody gave Eric a track. And he gave it to me, and it's this long on both sides. I mean, dude, he put just about the Bible on. And I went, that's a lot of reading, and the people I know ain't reading all that. You better have it quick and easy. (laughs) Exactly. But listen, you you can talk all you want. You can witness all you want. You can think you're better than someone else all you want. But until you know that you've been with him and you're carrying something everyone else needs, nothing's going to change really. If we come once a week and we leak, And someone needs us on Thursday to tell them about the goodness of God and to tell them there's a way out of their circumstance and a way in to being a child of God. And we got nothing to give because we haven't given God 10 minutes of our time. What will we say to him? I went to church. He's not out to condemn anyone. He's out to receive you. He's, he wants to hug you, to put you on his lap. He wants to high five you. He wants you to, he wants you to talk to him so he can talk back to you and change you. He, his words drip with love and transformation. His words carry everything you're going to need to carry it to the next person. He's not a God that is like us. We are like him. I don't care how much we kick and scream and try to make excuses for our life. He deserves all of you, all the time. His goodness should be a reality to you. Not just something we sing, not just something we say, 
but you'll never know his goodness if you haven't been with him. And when you're with him, how good he is will blow you away, which evidently we need blown away. Sorry, the eyes are attached to my nose. I don't get it. The kabod of God is necessary in our life. I believe that the weightiness of his glory is waiting for us. He wants to overtake each one of us, but I am waiting for you too. I am waiting for a bunch of people that have already spent time with God before they come through the door. I'm waiting for people who come in already ready to lift their hands and praise him and honor him for who he is and and be aware of the necessity to call on his name for others. I am waiting for people to jump and shout before anybody touches the piano or touches a guitar or because we've come together to call for things that have not yet been, been made into existence because together we create a different atmosphere than we do alone. What if the church of the living God became living? What if we became breathing the same thoughts as he does and we represented him in the way he deserves? What if the first thought in the morning was Jesus and what if he stayed on our thoughts every minute of the day, no matter what we face, still Jesus? Answer that yourself as far as would it change your life and do you think it would change someone else's? That's when he can take your darkness and turn it to light because he loves to reveal himself to you. He is the revelator. So we are literally making a way for his kingdom to come when we flow with him and we're all in. All in means all in. It means every bit of you, every thought that you have, all of your substance, it means all. All is all. It's everywhere now. It's on, it's on people's car licenses, all in. It's other pastors have it now as a series that they're doing all over the place. You know why? Because I didn't think of that. The Holy Spirit's saying it over and over and over through different people. I found out somebody said it a long time ago before I got it. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit wants us to get all in. So this is your opportunity. So just close your eyes. The Holy Spirit obviously is here. Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, they, they work in conjunction with each other. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings conviction, and it's a wonderful thing. Conviction means that he just wants you to turn in the, another direction. It doesn't mean that he's condemning you. Condemnation is the enemy. Conviction is offering you an opportunity. But when he's bringing a conviction to you, he's just letting you see that something needs to be adjusted in your life. Maybe there's something you need to let go of or renounce or, or get past. Maybe you need to forgive somebody. Maybe you, need to, maybe you just need to do these declarations every day. Maybe you forgot about what the word has to say and you need to get it stirred back up in your heart. But whatever he's doing, he's doing it for your benefit. Jesus is doing this for your benefit. The Holy Spirit is making it real for your benefit. You have to receive the benefit package from God right now. So 
So Holy Spirit, right now I ask that you would help each one identify where they don't identify with you. Lord, turn their hearts like wax before your presence, Lord. And mold them again in your image and your likeness. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would, you would bring things to their mind right now that they would let go of and be, gladly let go of that you would also bring to their mind what they can grab hold of. Lord, that your promises would be real to them, Lord. Tangible to them, Lord. I pray for a transformation, Lord. I pray for an excited people that stay excited in your presence and bring excitement with them wherever they go. And Lord, I pronounce upon them that they are your children, heirs according to your promise. That they will take what you have given them and they will wisely use it. And that the kingdom of God will expand here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I ask for that. I just feel like it's so personal. I don't want I don't want anybody raising their hand. I don't want I don't even want to see. I just want you to see Jesus. I just want you right now to connect with him. Connect with the true suffering that he went through for you individually. And honor him right now. So, Father, I just pray in Jesus' name. The changes that you are bringing inside of your people will be known and seen. Lord, I pray you change their minds. Oh, God. You said we could have the mind of Christ. So, Lord, I ask for that to superimpose upon their mindsets that need to change. You think way different than we do in the natural. Let that become their reality. Lord, I ask that you change their actions, the things that they do that are displeasing to you. Lord, I ask that you change them now in Jesus' name. I ask that you just give them different desires, that it won't be hard for them to change, but their desires will just change. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for making it easy by the horrible price you paid. But I thank you, God, will never forget the price that was paid. And Lord, I pray that we would become crazy, laid-down lovers of you, anxious to be with you over and over again until we realize who we are in you. We thank you for it. It's all your word. It's true. I thank you for stirring us up glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If there's somebody who needs prayer afterwards, you can, you can see me and I'll pray for you. Um. I believe God is really trying to do something in our midst. I believe that you have to have ears to hear. And if you do, you'll be changed. But that doesn't mean I don't, I don't think you're changing. It means there's something better that is available. And so take advantage of what God is offering. Amen? Amen. I love you. But who do we love the most?
and who loves us the most and who actually loves everyone, every rotten scandal <laughs> the most, right? Jesus does. So act accordingly, okay? Love you. If you would like to support this ministry with a financial contribution, visit our website at www.LibertyLifeCenter.org. Find the link to the left that says Donate Now and follow the instructions there. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing worldwide through this ministry.